Wake up, hockey fans. It is Thursday, January 4th. We have 13 NHL games tonight, only two last night. But there are still a lot of things to talk about, like we teased yesterday. My good friend Kobe Cohen and Frank Petrano, who scored a beautiful backhand goal against the Maple Leafs last night, have a little bit of beef that we're going to squash in the next couple days. But before are I we, say Are we more, squashing it? Is that the we plan? We're going to squash it. That's the plan. And we were going to talk about it and go into the situation a little <laughs> bit this morning. But instead... We spoke to Frank Petrano himself. We're going to get him on the show. We're going to have him on Monday. <laughs> and we're going to let you guys kind of hash it out yourself. So I'm really excited for that. Uh, I was talking a little bit with Frank last night after the game against the Leafs. And uh, I know he's pumped. Uh, I don't know if he's pumped, but I know he's excited to come on and see where it goes. Well, I know I know who you're siding with already. So um, obviously you're taking his side on this. And yeah. I was fully prepared to to start the show off today with, you know, airing out this situation, a situation in which I had forgotten about because this goes back to 2014. Yeah, uh, Johnny, years, though, man. as we learn, the internet saves everything. Um, you have lots of receipts for these types of things. And like you said, we, we were going to get into this this morning, but the fact that he he's going to actually come on and we're going to talk face to face for the first time ever, we've never <laughs> talked face to face. Let, let's just get that out there. So, um, I'm I'm looking forward to that too. I really am. So we'll we'll see where that goes. He did score a good uh, a nice goal last night against Toronto. Of course, I was laughing watching that game the minute he scored. I was just like, oh man, I, I'm losing my I'm losing ammo every, every minute of this game. I'm losing more ammo. Well, don't forget to like and subscribe to our show, Morning Cup of Hockey, on the Daily Faceoff YouTube channel. As you see, a nice little look at Frank Petrano's backhand goal last night. But Colby, I think we have a new segment that we're going to try out just called Beefing with Colby because apparently you just piss a lot of people off. <laughs> that is definitely a, a skill and a talent of mine. Um, and I do think that we probably could develop a segment like that, especially because, you know, Twitter apparently doesn't delete things. So when you when you go into the archives, who, who knows what you're going to find on there. <laughs> <laughs> and in the theme of pissing people off, in that Ducks Maple Leafs game, there was a pretty big hit. Bobby McMahon, the Colgate product on Pavel Minchikov, resulted in a five minute major. I think we actually both agree on this. I didn't like the call. Uh, Kobe, do you want to talk about it as a defenseman in that position? Yeah. I mean, not only did I not like the call, I didn't think it was a penalty. Like, I thought this was a hockey play. It's always unfortunate when a player gets hurt. You, you never want to see that. And, um, you know, McMahon is just finishing a check as the defenseman's trying to get the red line, and I'm just going to continue to go back to this situation of why do players not protect themselves at all? I've been in that exact situation uh, trying to gain the red line, and I was slow, so I was usually <laughs> behind the forward who was coming after me. And you've got to make sure that you do not expose yourself that far, get closer to the wall. I mean, there's just so many things that you can do, but when you feel like you're not going to get hit, um, it just changes the way that you play. It's almost like quarterbacks now in the NFL. These guys can't hit quarterbacks, so they don't know what to do. They they can't play as hard um, on the ball when the ball is snapped. So I didn't like it. The fact that they reviewed it and they looked at it and they talk about it and then they still um, turned around and kicked him out of the game. I really hope he doesn't get suspended, McMahon. I really do. I mean, that would be to me bad because you're just again you're 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 taking away the physical identity of hockey and I, I just hate to see that because I think what happens is is players play with their head down players are less aware players don't protect themselves and and that's really when players get hurt so again I, I thought this was a good hockey play um you know I, I think McMahon's doing his job and the other thing that I just want to say and I'm going to say this a thousand times this year is you cannot watch things in slow motion in hockey and then judge how you feel about a play because things don't happen in slow motion. Yeah, things I thought you actually made a great point. I thought you made a great point on the fact that Pavel Minchikov needs to get closer to the boards. Like when you expose yourself, you know, two feet, three feet away from the boards, anytime you get hit, it's going to look ugly when you go into the boards, right? No matter what, even if it's from the front, obviously if it's from the back, it's going to look even worse. But Bobby McMahon, Listen, I was never a physical forward. I didn't throw the body much. When I saw a defenseman in that position, that's when I was like licking my chops and I'm like, here we go. I can light this guy up. Like, and, and I'm not, and that's when I could look like I throw big hits, right? Like that was the position I could be in to do so. Well, this, but this from is a why they got perspective. 
Yeah, this is why they got rid of the pointed glass all around the benches because you mm-hmm. see this happening on the other side of the ice by the benches. That's why everything's round now. Leading into both benches, it's round. You don't have it happened in the PWHL in. yesterday too. There you go. I mean, I still remember when it happened to um, Max Pacioretty. It, uh, mm-hmm. You know, I was with the Boston Bruins and and Char kind of rubbed him out, and he ends up hitting the turnbuckle there. But sort of a similar type of play, trying to get a puck deep. So. Again, those are really not malicious plays, although they look malicious. But the problem is, is if McMahon doesn't finish his check there um, and he just kind of turns off, then you never know. You know, Michikov is going to try to take that puck deep. He might keep trying to skate with it. It might lead to an odd man rush. And then he comes back to the bench and his coaching staff's wondering why, uh, um, you know, a a bottom six type of player isn't finishing their check, isn't playing through guys. So Again, disappointed uh, in the call here, disappointed the fact that the officials um, gave him a game misconduct, a five-minute major, because, you know, those types of penalties, Johnny, they, they can really change the outcome of a game. Yeah, I completely agree. And that game had a lot of craziness in it. Austin Matthews scored his 30th goal of the season on his 13th shot on goal on the Leafs' 50th shot of the night. Uh, an absolute wild game out there in Anaheim. A big win for Toronto on the back-to-back riding Martin Jones. Uh, so good for Toronto. Two pretty big wins, even though, you know, Anaheim is somewhat of a weaker opponent. But they go into L.A., they shut out the Kings, and they follow it up with a big yeah. win against the Ducks. Maybe the, the Leafs are rolling here come second half. Well, and you got to remember, too, you get to California. The weather's a little bit nicer. There's more distractions. It's a back-to-back. Um, you know, John Gibson was not even in net for Anaheim. You would mm-hmm. think when you see 50-plus shots, only two goals, you're thinking John Gibson. Um, but it, it was Dostal, one of the backup goaltenders there uh, in Anaheim. But look, Austin Matthews is just such a pure scorer. I mean, he, the way the puck gets on and off his stick, the velocity in which he does it with, you know, the way he finds himself space all around the ice. This guy is going to continue to score 20, 30, 40, up to 50 goals a year for a long time. I mean, he he really is incredible to watch, Johnny. But, you know, before we kind of, continue to move through these games. I, I, I just want to say one thing about Anaheim um, and then we'll kind of save it because we're going to have Frank Vetrano next week <laughs> so we can talk more Anaheim. But how, again? Does, how, how does Cam Fowler only make six and a half million dollars? And how does John Gibson only make six point four million dollars? Like these are two guys that are like right around 30 years old and Fowler's got two years left at six and a half million dollars. Look, by the time Anaheim's good, Fowler's going to be 33, 34 years old before they're really all the way through their rebuild. Trade Cam Fowler for a King's ransom. You can get other teams' top prospects for a guy like Cam Fowler. He's so good and so underrated. Any team that um, is is looking to win the Stanley Cup, like look at Toronto, $6.5 million for Cam Fowler. I'd rather have Cam Fowler than Willie Nylander if you're Toronto. I, I really would. Get the yeah. fuck out of here. I'm no no you, way. Listen, I'm just telling you right now, people don't realize how good Cam Fowler is. because No disrespect to Cam Fowler. I, I don't know if anyone would agree with you on that. But, Johnny, I'm not saying in a one-for-one situation here. I'm just saying if you have $11.5 million to spend on Willie Nylander and you could bring in Cam Fowler, who is a legitimate number one defenseman in the NHL, the reason he isn't talked about more is because he plays in Anaheim Anaheim his entire career. This is a legit number one who makes six and a half million dollars for two years after this. Do you understand how good of a contract that is? That is insane asset management for a guy who is a legit number one. There isn't 30 number one defensemen in the NHL. There isn't. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. But I'm just telling you, Money well spent. I, I, I'm not saying trade them for each other. I'm just saying if you could get Cam Fowler on the Toronto Maple Leafs, we are talking way different about the Toronto Maple Leafs. And the guy only makes six and a half million. I mean, this is a $10, 11000000 million defenseman. He, he's that good. So He's been around for a long time, too. Watching that experience. game last night just re-reminded me how good Cam Fowler is. And again, John Gibson, who didn't play last night, is a stud. And he only makes 6.4 for three, million, for three more years. So, you know, uh, we'll, say, we'll save the Anaheim talk from, from there. But I, I just, I felt like I needed to air that out. <laughs> well, you're going you're gonna to save the Anaheim talk? What are you going to ask Frank when he hops on? Would you trade for Willie Nylander? Would you get rid of Cam Fowler? Is that what you're going to ask him? 
Listen, I'm just saying, Cam Fowler is is not given the respect and the love in the NHL that he deserves. That guy is a stud. I, I completely agree, and I guess we'll play armchair GM with Frank Vetrano when he comes on on, on Monday. But uh, I'm not asking go. him that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, please, please do not. I'm talking uh, shit. I'm not asking that. <laughs> Let's go into um, the player uh, department of player safety. Excuse me. It was a busy couple of days for George Paros. Jason Zucker gets three games. Nick Cousins gets nothing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think George Paros has a tough job, and I think he's a smart guy. I really do. I mean, he went to Down Princeton, so head. obviously he's Fallen a smart guy, but. Cousins. You know, I said on our show that I thought, you know, Zucker might get four, might. I, I was like, I, I I think I said three to four games is, is kind of what I thought would happen. Um, and that is what happened. So I'm not in any really level of disagreement with the decision because it was retribution. It was, you know, it was to the head. He did kind of smash his face into the glass. Um, I think it could have been worse. I think he really could have crunched him from there. I think he kind of held up a little bit, but Again, the officials, they don't make the call for Cousins. Second time in a couple of weeks, Cousin gets away with a dirty little play. Yeah, I was going to say he's got to be the most uh, hunted after guy in the NHL right now with how he's getting away with everything. Well, he's getting away with it. The officials aren't calling it, and then it spirals, and then players start taking it into their own hands. And and I think we've seen that now around the NHL and some other circumstances. So I thought three games was reasonable for Zucker. I really did. Um, but I think Nick Cousins should have gotten a game suspension. I really do. I, I still absolutely have play on Valamaki when he's down, totally defenseless, on your knees. That was almost like a knee and an elbow to the head. So I... I I hated that one as well, um, but I, I do think George Paros has a difficult job. Yeah, I mean, one game for Cousins should have been what, what the outcome was. Uh, I think you know anyone who watched that hit would probably agree, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens uh, tonight. Vegas versus Florida, Stanley Cup final rematch, which we'll talk about a little bit later on the show, but Nick Cousins, again, I'm sure we'll get in the mix uh, with that team, so we'll see how that plays out with number 21 in Florida, but another situation with George Peros is Ryan Hartman's high sticking fine on Cole Perfetti, which has caused a lot of discussion around the NHL. I actually tuned in to Sportsnet last night. I saw it on Twitter, uh, the dressing room, Jamal Mayers and Jennifer Botterill were going after it uh, in, in, in a good spirit, though, like not, you know, a heated argument, but um, some good debate. We'll see the high stick right here. Ryan Hartman right off the draw just gets Perfetti right in the jibs, which is somewhat of a cheap shot. I mean, not somewhat. It was definitely a cheap shot. And, uh, Kobe, I want to hear your thoughts before I go into mine because I feel pretty strongly about this one myself. Yeah, I mean, look, Hartman a, is a hard-nosed player. Like, he is. Um, I actually have always liked the way Hartman plays. I think he's been, you know, kind of an honest player who's reinvented himself in different organizations. He's really found a home in Minnesota. I like that he plays physical. I didn't like this. Um, take a guy's number. Go run him, catch him open ice. Um, I'm not saying run him from behind. I'm just saying gone are the days when you took a guy's number and then waited for him to come across the middle. Um, although I know that they're, you know, they're, they're kind of getting rid of those hits, but Truba does it and he doesn't get called. He doesn't get suspended because he's a yeah. phenomenal hitter. Um, so I, I'm not a fan of using your stick to get retribution in the mouth of a player. You know, I thought the, the 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 retribution was for what Brendan Dillon did, a couple of cross checks on Kaprizov, um, you know, earlier in the season. What was that? A couple of weeks ago or something like that, maybe two weeks ago. And I I thought those were just hard hockey plays. Like, yeah, you're cross checking a guy, but like you're working in the pants, hip. though. Yeah, you're the working pants. a guy's hip. You're working a guy's hip. I mean, I, I I didn't see that as such a dirty play like everybody else did. Obviously, mostly Minnesota fans, but. Um, I, I didn't like what, what Hartman did, the way he got his retribution, but the whole situation, Johnny, was kind of weird. And I, I know we have some sound because Perfetti was asked about it, but before we, before we listen to Perfetti getting interviewed or media scrummed, um, I'm, I'm interested, like, what, what are your thoughts? You said you have a strong opinion. Um, you know, normally your opinions are all sunshine and rainbows. So let's hear your strong opinion, Johnny, and then we'll decide if we actually think it's a strong opinion. Well, I think Jennifer Botterill really said it perfectly last night. Like I mentioned before, like there's a difference between playing the game hard, playing the game tough and playing the game just fucking cheap, to be honest. And, and Hartman 
literally just took a cheap shot at Perfetti, who had nothing to do with the play on Dylan and Kaprizov. And I get it. You want to stick up for your teammates. You want to show that you have uh, grit or whatever the word would be in that scenario. But it's not just taking liberties at a guy who's, you know, nothing to do with the play. Um, like you said, taking a number is all fine and and throwing a big hit, you know, getting in the mix, stirring shit up after the whistle. I'm cool with that. But off a draw, like a guy is defenseless, nothing covering his yeah. face. Like, you know, that's that's where I think it's just Ch- a bad a look. chicken shit. It, it's a bad look for the game, right? It's yeah. just disrespectful to the game. And, you know, obviously, like you said, we'll hear the comments from Perfetti because it's pretty surprising that uh, Hartman, you know, was caught on a microphone talking about it with Perfetti. So we'll, we'll tee that up right now. To follow on that, Cole, did he make it pretty clear that he was doing that as retribution for what had happened the day before? Yeah, yeah, he did. He made it pretty obvious, you know. He did it in a, I mean, he said it in kind of a respectful way. Like, I mean, he said no uh, no disrespect, no nothing against you. Just, you know, it had to happen. Some, some, something had to happen against, you know, what, for, for what happened to Kaprizov there. I mean, he's obviously going to be out for a little bit. And, you know, I don't think Gilly was trying to hurt him. I think he's just playing heavy. And that's just, you know, that play happens. Like, you know, he wasn't, I don't think, trying to be a, you know, a bad guy I think he was just you know that's what he thought he needed to do to get back at us um, and that's what he chose to do um, you know I was saying to a couple of guys like lucky it wasn't like a cheap shot hit or a, you know from behind or to the head or something that could have been serious luckily it was just a couple stitches and um, I mean kind of a weird thing to come out and admit it that you know he uh, blatantly said that you know it was for what happened and, well, I didn't even do anything in the play. I had nothing to do with it. And, I mean, hey, whatever. It's all good. You were Mike against. So with that, and Kobe, I'm sure you had a bunch of teammates when you were younger that did stupid shit that you know maybe other guys had to answer for. And the message that you know Jamal Mayers and and Botterill were kind of discussing was, if if one guy does something on your team, another guy shouldn't have to pay for that. Because one guy's stupidity is is not the team's stupidity. Nah, I don't agree with you on that. You don't agree? No. Really? Okay. Why is I that? don't agree. Listen, it's a team game. So I, I, I don't, I mean, sure. Would I rather see you grab the guy's number? Would yeah. like go after Dylan, but Dylan's a big boy. Like they don't, they don't want to go for Dylan. He's um, also apparently one of the nicest guys in the NHL from what I've heard who, too. Brendan Dylan. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, maybe he is, but he, he's a mean prick on the ice well, That's yeah, the way sure. that he plays. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I, I mean, this is kind of a, a tough video to watch and listen to. Like, I'm not really sure. And Perfetti, I mean, look, the kid's a phenomenal player. I mean, I, I think he's got a, a world of talent. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's already a really good player in the NHL. I think he's got a big ceiling to be, you know, a real legitimate top line player in the NHL. But like, I don't understand going into that. If, if you're going to sit there and talk about it publicly, which again, no problem. Why yeah. are you sitting there saying it's all good? It's no big deal. He was respectful about it. Like this would have been the perfect time to like pull up your big boy pants and send a message back. I mean, these are teams that could play each other in the playoffs. And honestly, like they're going to walk all over Cole Perfetti physically. Now Um, guys on the Minnesota bench are going to be chirping them. I mean, that just interview, like, again, you're a rat for doing that. Would you say he's a rat? No, I'm not even saying he's a rat. Go ahead. Talk about it in the media. Like have a personality about it. You're okay with sticking you in the mouth. It's all good. Oh, it's all good. He told me he was going to stick me in the mouth and then he (laughs) did it. Like grow a pair of balls. Holy shit. Like I'm as disappointed in the response from Perfetti as I am in Hartman for, for sticking him in the mouth. Like, again, I don't like the play. I don't think sticking a guy in the mouth is the way you get a guy back. I'm all for retribution. I love the retribution. I love the sandpaper, the rivalry. These are teams that could play each other in the playoffs. Um, I don't know. Minnesota's right now in seventh in the central. I don't know if they're sniffing and, the playoffs. And they're fading out. I agree. Yeah. But but again, they're both in the central division. They both see each other. They're four-point games. They're emotional games. Both their buildings are always loud. You know, I just like I, I can't understand um, you know, what why Cole Perfetti is is talking about it in this manner. Like, take it, take a stance, have a spine. I don't know. What would you like, have said, I, Kobe? What would you have said? 
I mean, look, he's a young kid. He doesn't right? want to so, be a target, though. Like, if he comes out and says, yeah, that's fucking shit. Like, you know, that can't happen. Like, that, I think that makes him a target. Matter. Well. He just got stuck. He just that's like someone coming up to you and say, I'm going to stuff you in a locker, Johnny. So you just go, all right, let me just get in the locker. So you can, well, I guess that's better than you here. tripping me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, yeah. give me a break. I'm like I, you're, you're, you're a either. professional athlete. You're a man. Like, you know, stand up for yourself a little bit. It, it's not okay for a guy to say he's going to stick you in the mouth and then do it. You know, like have a spine, even if you don't do anything, at least pretend like you would at least pretend like you'll stick up for yourself. I, again, I just think, he completely laid down, you know, there. And I think players are going to take advantage of that on any team, any night. Well, let me ask you this. Who's a bigger target the next time these two teams meet, Hartman or Perfetti? I mean, I don't – honestly, I don't think necessarily either because I do think there's a lot of eye for an eye in the NHL. And I think mm -hmm. right now we've, we've seen eye for an mm -hmm. eye. Um, you know, I just think the games will be physical. I think players who don't generally finish their checks are going to be finishing their checks those nights. And, and I think guys will be looking for it a little bit more. So again, I, the whole thing is a little bit bizarre to me. I, I, I'd rather see guys drop their gloves. I really would. I think that's what fighting is for. It, it's for, you know, self-policing in the game, um, not sticking a guy in the mouth. Uh, you yeah. know, that's really, really, really old school. Like, we're going back 70s, 80s type of stuff there, which, you know, I I'm not saying is good for the game at all. So, you know, we'll keep an eye on this matchup the next time, you know, they come around to play each other. But again, I, I don't think Perfetti at the end of the day did himself any favors the way that he responded to this in the media. So, yeah, I agree. I actually thought that was very well said. And uh, another matchup that NHL fans had their eyes glued to last night was Nico Dawes versus Hunter Shepard, uh, the Capitals and the Devils. Uh, it actually was a great game, though, NHL and TNT, always entertaining. Um, Max Pacioretty makes his return and makes his, believed debut with the Washington Capitals. What did you make of his performance last night? He wasn't very thrilled with it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I wasn't expecting a whole lot. Um, you know, and you go way back with him, right? I've known Max a long time. Uh, we played against each other, you know, all the way through. Um, we dropped the gloves I, back. I don't know whether it was like a USHL top prospects game or a USA hockey prospects game, or maybe it was a regular season game. Honestly, I, it's so hard to remember, um, but we have dropped the gloves before. Um, who won? Uh, who won that fight? I, I think it was probably pretty even. He'd probably okay. say him, but I, <laughs> I, I, I probably... Um, we, we always had some weird beef playing. I, I really, I, I never really knew what it was about. Um, I think part of it was just kind of coming up at the same time and battling for, you know, top spots of different areas and drafts and, and this and that. So um, we'll get them on for the segment then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Um, but you know, <laughs> the list is growing. Um, look, here's what I'll say about him two two achilles two torn achilles i mean that that's that's stuff to come back from yeah he's a big man bigger guys break down a little bit more um they have a d more difficult time getting back in shape you know i think max in his day was one of the premier power forwards in the nhl whether i liked him or not personally i could still say that you know this was a hard guy to play against playing against him in, at michigan hard to play against um because he could score but he could also run you over um, I remember one of the biggest hits I ever saw my D partner in college, Kevin Shattenkirk take was over by the bench at Yost arena. Pasharetti absolutely just blew him up. So, you know, I think that's going to be a process. I think it's probably going to take him a couple of months to really start to find his legs and find his game. Um, but I will say that, uh, it's, it's good to get him back. It's good to see him playing. You, you root for guys, you know, to come back from these types of situations. Um, but I do think, Ultimately, it's going to be a little bit of a long road back for, for Pasharetti. I'm not expecting to see a ton out of him immediately. Is he also what the Capitals need? I mean, I've been saying it now for a couple of days. Like, I think this team is just headed to the gutter. Uh, I'm not a fan of what Washington has lineup wise. Again, I know they've dealt with some injuries and whatnot this year, but I, I am very confident in saying there's no shot in hell. I think the Capitals make the playoffs. Well, without Lindgren too. I mean, Lindgren, their goaltender is injured right now, and and you know, last night was was just bad goaltending, really bad for both teams. I mean, Hunter Shepard was bad. Nico Dawes was not much better. There was a lot of soft goals. Soft goals deflate your team. I mean, it's it's nearly impossible to win when you're giving up soft 
soft goals. Like goals will happen. Guys will make good shots. You know, guys will make plays, but softies kill you. And it was just kind of one softy. I mean, three or four of the goals last night go in right along the ice. I mean, goalies just can't, you can't let multiple goals in right along the ice, you know, just for not having your stick down, not having your paddle down, uh, not necessarily being in position. So um, kind of a, an exciting game to watch because there was so much back and forth, but bad goaltending. And, and it worries me a little bit as the NHL continues to talk expansion because look, there's not enough good goaltenders in the NHL as it is. And it's almost like starting quarterbacks in the NFL. It, it's just, it's bad when that position is not right. Um, Frank said it on our show on Tuesday, you know, we'll just call it goalie rather than hockey. Cause you just can't yeah. win without one. So um you know, that, that game was 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 kind of the spotlight was stolen by them. Ovechkin figured in, you know, had some points, but the Devils sort of outscored their problems and and find themselves in a playoff spot for the first time, you know, maybe this whole season, at least in a while. That's for sure. Yeah, they're six, three and one in their last 10. I think the Devils are starting to, you know, turn in a positive direction here. Like you said, though, they are outscoring their goaltending problems, which, you know, most teams do that, though, like Toronto was doing it for a bit. Uh, but now they've gotten so solid goaltending the last couple of games from Martin Jones, uh, which who could have guessed that for uh, this season's bingo card. Um, but again, like the Devils are a scary team when they're at their best, even though last night probably wasn't their best. But they're starting to turn here, and the Devils are a team with the Met right now. The division is getting very tight. The Rangers have a game again tonight. The Carolina Hurricanes got within five points. I mean, the Devils are only nine points back, and they're in the second wild card spot. This division continues to get tighter and tighter i mean the east is an absolute dogfight just like it was last year but do you think the devils are a legit contender to even win the division because they're only nine points no. back like i just said you don't think so i don't not unless they go out and get john gibson i think if they go out and get john gibson um i think that changes changes everything for them but you're you're just right now their goaltending is a disaster schmidt just got sent down to the american league um you know dawes was okay last night. I, like I said, maybe below two average. Um, two v, Vitek Vanacek, um, his game, they're, they're trying to figure out what's going on with him. He's got career worst numbers. So, you know, it, it really, it, it, they got problems there, there uh, in Jersey, Johnny. So no, I, I don't think they're legit. I, I don't, not until they solve that, you know, goaltending issue. Well, that's probably going to be something that we, you know, come along with and learn later on as the season continues here, as we get closer and closer to the trade deadline. But there is a ton of action outside the NHL today, as far as the world juniors go. And we're going to go on a little break right now, but don't go anywhere because when we come back, we got Dave Starman, who's going to be on the call for USA today at one thirty Eastern time talking. So don't go anywhere. We're going to go for a quick break and we got Dave Starman when we come back.
Welcome back to Morning Cup of Hockey. And we are now joined by a good friend of mine, uh, a guy that you've probably been hearing and seeing quite a bit on your TV if you've been following along with the World Juniors. We've got the color analyst, Dave Starman, joining us here. And, and I'll just give you a little bit more of an intro, Dave, because you're one of these guys that is a total jack of all trades. You call games for the World Juniors. You call games for the NCAA. You do the Frozen Four in the National Championship. You scouted in the NHL for years. You played. You coached. You've really done a little bit. You're a hockey dad. You've got a son who plays U18 hockey for the New Jersey Titans. So you've really done it all, and you've seen it at so many different levels. So we appreciate the fact that you jumped on here to chat with us before calling this uh, semifinal game between the U.S. and Finland. Uh, first of all, I think it's going to be a great game to start with, but uh, also just in, in mentioning the Titans, Colby, you know, you've done your share of coaching too, and I am beyond thrilled, as I've told you a number of times, that you are back with the Titans and working with Ryan's team. And I, it is so important, I think, for players that have achieved success to be able to get back with the younger players and impart a lot of their experience because your, your hard yards, your sweat equity in the game, and, and I say this about you and, and other players that are doing it, it's so important to give back because of the experiences that you had. And it's amazing the impact that I think that we all make on these younger players by doing what we do to make them better because it just makes them enjoy the game so much more. And we're certainly seeing that manifest at the World Juniors. Well, well speaking of younger love, players, oh, can I, I, can I jump in here, Kobe? No, no, you just sit okay. on the side for now, okay? <laughs> I, I certainly love driving your son crazy every day, Star, because I know there were a lot of moments in my broadcasting career where you were giving me hard feedback. So I like that I now get to give it to the next generation of the Starman family to try to pump them up a little bit. Actually, you know what they say, it rolls downhill, right? So <laughs> just keep it rolling. Well, I'm going to jump in now because Kobe said a friend of his, but I'd say a friend of ours. I don't want to miss out on the friendship here, Dave. We Absolutely. go back now a couple years, but – you speak of the added pressure to the younger players today in the World Junior, and Canada's taken a lot of flack for their you know, upset in the quarterfinal round. Do you think there's too much pressure right now on the young kids to perform in the World Junior when it used to just be a showcase for younger talent that could be in the NHL in the future? I think that's a really good question, and I think the answer is yes and no, but more on the yes side. I do think that because this event has so blown up over the last 16 years – and I'd like to think that in the U.S. it has because of the coverage that it's gotten from the NHL network and the investment that they've made in it. I, I think that we, when you take a look at this tournament, everybody knows everything now. There's much more media coverage. There's much more uh, fans paying attention. There's much more interest in prospects on the hockey side than there used to be. It used to be just more of a college football thing. Now it's a huge hockey thing. And, you know, these players are getting followed now, especially because of social media from the time that they're 13, 14 years old especially those in the upper 5% of their birth year. So when they get to the world stage like this, there's not a lot of secrets out there on these guys, but now everybody's expecting them to perform like they're NHL players because they're going to be. But just because of the fact that they might be the first overall pick in the draft or they were a first-round pick, all that means is that somebody thinks that they can be pretty special somewhere down the road. It doesn't mean that they're the complete package just yet. And a lot of the flack, that Canada is getting for losing that game, I think is really undeserved. Yeah, it's certainly been an exciting tournament. If you're a, an American hockey fan, as our Americans settle in to play Finland a little bit later today, obviously you'll be on the call. You can catch that game on the NHL network. But Star, I just ask you as a guy who has scouted in the NHL and you've sat in meetings with general managers, you've been at the table for drafts, free agency. Like I said, you've had such a well-rounded background of working in hockey who are the players on this u.s team that we're going to see playing in the nhl this year potentially even making an impact come playoff time i know i think there might be a couple but you're the guy who knows this better than anyone you know that's also a pretty good question i think i'll tell you what when you look at the way that cutter goche has played this year and i know the plan for him was go back for another year of college hockey to come out a little bit bigger stronger faster and and more put together but he has so impressed me with the diversity that he has shown in this tournament. You think back a few years, like think back to Kiefer Bellows a few years ago. Here was a guy that was a high-end pick, had a tremendous shot, could impact games with the way he shoots the puck. But to me, he was more of just a shooter than anything else. And when I look at Goche, Goche can be as, as effective as Bellows in terms of delivering the puck to the net with the way that he does. 
But this tournament has opened a lot of people's eyes, I think, that haven't seen him play on a regular basis to how much of a puck distributor he could be, how good he could be on faceoffs, how well he could find options, whether it be power play or even strength, how well he uses his size. I mean, this to me has been a really good tournament for a guy like Goche, who to me is going to be the prototypical power forward style player when he gets to the National Hockey League in terms of being able to go up and down in straight lines and be strong and get pucks to the net. Here's the thing. I'm old. I remember John LeClaire as a player. This guy looks a whole lot like John LeClaire did. Well, Dave, we're not used to seeing the World Juniors being played in a country like Sweden. I think, you know, Colby has expressed it a lot this past week how the World Juniors should be hosted in Canada every year because no one cares as much about the World Juniors as the Canadians. But the Swedish crowd has done a very good job coming out to support the games. And right now, Sweden and Czechia are actually tied at 1-1 in the semifinal. Do you think the Americans are rooting for Sweden? I know they're worried about their own game right now, but is there a case to be made that the Americans want to face Sweden in the final just for the atmosphere to be as great as it possibly could be? Because I know in past years, when it's USA, Canada, and it's on home turf, the crowds are incredible. And if Czechia does go on, maybe the crowd might not be as good as people would hope. Uh, that's a fair point. I, I think that when you are picking your poison in terms of who you want to play for a championship game, you can There's get no, we yourself want better, chance going on, huh? Right, you can, you can get yourself in all kinds of mental trouble in that situation. But from the crowd perspective, like I remember doing that gold medal game in Saskatoon in 2010, U.S. Canada. That building was electric. I have never been in a building that was that unbelievably ramped up, excited, loud, intense than Game Seven of the 1994 Cup Finals between Vancouver and the Rangers at the Garden. And I mean, that place was just—you could feel it in the ground. How unbelievable the momentum was and the energy in that building so i do think as a player you certainly want that for your gold medal type game but i, I do think you have to be careful when you think about who you want to pick to play yeah. the, the the checks are a hard out like to me if i'm the u.s that's the last team i want to play right now is the checks but on the other hand the swedes have been i think i mean they've been good they might have been a little underrated in terms of they haven't got a lot of attention outside of sweden in terms of what they're doing because everybody's been wrapped up u.s canada but the Swedes are good. I mean, they can defend really well. They got nice skill. They can, they can score. The goaltending's been good. I mean, like, pick your poison on that one. The softer game will be the Swedes. The less talented team is probably the Czechs. But I got news for you. Neither one of those two teams is going to be a pushover if the U.S. gets one of them in a gold medal game. Yeah, you get to this stage of these one-game elimination tournaments, and you're just playing against good hockey players. It really doesn't matter who you're playing against. Um Star, I, I've loved watching Rutger McGroarty, and, and I loved watching him at Michigan last year. I, I know he's dealt with some injuries heading into this tournament. He's a Winnipeg Jets first rounder. I think a future captain in the NHL. He's a coach's kid. Um, I think for me, he's an X factor because I think you get into a game like this and he's like a bull around the net. And I think obviously Cutter Goche, we already talked about how important he is, but um is there any other guys? Do, do you agree with the fact that that Rutger McGroarty can really be an X factor? Am I missing out on some other top prospects that you think can really kind of steal the show uh, the next couple of days to to bring a gold home to to the United States? Yeah, I think you're bang. I think you're bang on with McGroarty. I mean, he's been great, and it's interesting because we just talked about Goche. McGroarty is equally as important to the team, and they were on that line with Jimmy Snuggerud, and then Snuggerud got sick. So they moved Oliver Moore up to that line. And when that happened, all of a sudden, Goche and McGroarty started to score. And basically what happened was you, with Snuggerud and Goche, you had two big-time scorers on the same line. So now that they've separated them, you got a gunner on each line, and you move Moore up to help create a little bit more time and space with how well he can handle the puck and his speed. So like he's made McGroarty a better player in a lot of ways. And obviously on the power play, McGroarty has found some pay dirt too. So – I think you're correct on that. I think McGroarty is a big, strong bull of a kid in front of the net who has made a huge impact. But when you take a look at some guys that are maybe flying under the radar, like Danny Nelson from the University of Notre Dame and Islanders draft choice, he's been pretty good. He's been steady. That line with Finley and Snugger, I've really liked. The BC line, I think, has played well. They, at times, have been a little under the radar. At times, they've been front and center. But they've been really good. They've been really strong. They've been really dependable. I'll tell you what. Let me turn it around to your side of the coin, Colby, the defense core. The defense core on this team was talked about being a little bit too small. And I think coverage wise, it's been a little loose and guys like Hudson and Casey can play a little high risk, high reward at times and potentially escape themselves into some trouble. But I think for the most part, this decor has answered the bell over the last couple of games and the big boys like Renzel, Polkamp, Chesley on that right side, 
those guys have been absolute rock stars defending, which has made a lot of the offense go because of how well the big guys have killed some plays early in zones. Dave, you mentioned the 2010 game in Saskatoon. It's been announced that Minnesota might be hosting the 2026 World Juniors. Is there a favorite spot that you've been able to call the World Junior from? And is there a location or venue where you would dream to call a World Junior from? Well, with no disrespect to the NHL Network, it's not Secaucus. That I'll tell you. I mean, you know, I know it's the I know it's the jewel of the Meadowlands, but there's nothing like being on site. I'll tell you, Saskatoon was unbelievable. I mean, that was great. Ottawa was really good in 2009. Uh, Buffalo in 11 had a lot of jam to it because the U.S. came in as a defending gold medal champions, like they did in 2018. But kind of Buffalo got a little saturated by 18 because it was there for the second time. Toronto kind of had that feel like it was a little saturated because we were going that second time through. But the outdoor the outdoor game in Buffalo was unbelievable was awesome. in 18. The gold medal game in Montreal in 2017 was great. And I was scouting for the Habs at the time, so it was really special for, for me in that respect. But is there a place that I would love to call a World Junior game? I, I, for years, I've said Orlando, Tampa might be great. Like, Colby, we've done Frozen Fours in Tampa. Unbelievable. Like, there's a part of me that thinks, yeah, there's a part of me that thinks Tampa would yeah. be a great spot for a gold medal game for the World Juniors. They, they know how to host big events in Tampa. And when the weather's nice, people are in a good mood and they're ready to have a good time. And, you know, a lot of the players that Dave was talking about, you know, throughout that segment, you know, are all going to be NHL players. I mean, we lost, unfortunately, we got disconnected from Dave. Um, maybe something going on with his internet. But, you know, he's talking about Snuggerud, who's a first round pick. He's talking about Oliver Moore, Blackhawks first round pick, Sam Renzel. Blackhawks first round pick as Dave was kind of running through a number of these players, you know, I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, the NHL is in good hands because, you know, it, it is loaded with talent, whether it was Celebrini for Canada, whether it's Willander um, for Sweden, who was the 11th overall pick to Vancouver, uh, whether it's Rutger McGrory, who, like I said, I will bet money right now. We can keep the receipts. Um, I think Rutger McGroarty is future captain of the Winnipeg Jets. I, I really do. That's how strongly I believe in this kid as a player and as a person. So um, thanks to Dave Starman yeah. for coming on. Uh, he did such a great – oh, we got him back. Perfect. Star, I'm glad we were able to get you back as I was just thanking you because the one last thing that I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, um, the one last thing I want to ask Dave about as, as we work on bringing him back into the show is his tie selection. Um, he put something, Johnny, on Twitter. I don't know if you saw it. I've always given him a hard time about his ties, but I told him in this case, I very much approve of the tie selection. I know we have the tweet and we're going to be able to show it if you're watching on video. Obviously, if you're listening on Spotify or podcast, you're not going to hear it. But Dave, give, a, give us the backstory behind the tie selection for the next couple of days. All right, so the one that's got all the stars and stripes, that one was given to me by Mark Tabor, who at the time was the coaching director or the coaching education program director for USA Hockey, which I'd been with for about 25 years. And uh, both of us are big Grateful Dead fans. We're both deadheads. We love the Garcia ties. And he bought me that a few years back to wear for all gold medal games. But it's become my December 31st and gold medal game tie. So that's that one. The other one is really interesting. I was at the funeral of Tim Taylor in Boston a few years back, and it was at, uh, I think it was at Harvard. And uh oh, the connection is, is poor, it seems like. Yeah, we're having a hard time yeah. uh, fully getting Dave connected. He is in his hotel room in Secaucus. Like we mentioned, he's, he's a couple hours away from calling this USA Finland game for NHL network. So sometimes when you're at the mercy of that hotel Wi-Fi, uh, there's only so much you can do, but um, always insightful, Johnny. I mean, I know I learn a lot from star whenever he's on the broadcast. Yeah. And I remember the first time I spoke to star, man, you told me it was actually on the show I was doing called the locker room back a couple of years ago. And you're like, make sure you bring up his ties. Cause he loves talking about it. But uh, <clears throat> excuse me. One name I wanted to mention, too, that he briefly brought up, Kobe, that you might be familiar with as well, was Oliver Moore, who was picked in the first round by the Chicago Blackhawks, and he probably will be Connor Bedard's linemate one day. The kid's got a hell of a personality. Uh, I got to talk to him at the NHL draft this year. He was incredibly funny, 
uh, had a ton of riz, as the young kids like to say as well. Um, but Oliver Moore, I think, has been you know a player that's gone under the radar in college hockey over at the University of Minnesota, and he's certainly a guy that people should watch this afternoon when the USA takes on Finland. Oliver Moore is going to be a phenomenal NHL player and personality uh, one day soon. You got any predictions for the game? I'm going to say it's a low-scoring game. I think 3-2 U.S., and uh, I could see it going into extra time, playing overtime. Okay. You? I, I like the U.S. 4-1. to one. I, I think the U.S. has trended in the right direction through this tournament. I think they've gotten better and better, um, and I think their goaltending is just incredible between you know Fowler and Augustine, um, you know, both future stud NHLers. The U.S. does a great job of bringing in good young goaltending talent, so <laughs> Uh, lots to watch today. If you're if you're home, if you have the ability to get on NHL Network, make sure you tune in. Um, again, we'll thank Starman. Again, I know he was popping in and popping out. We did the best that we could. Um, he might just we'll keep all... showing up. We don't know. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so yeah, that's uh, that's what we got for World Juniors. We'll we'll see. We'll see if we have more to talk about or if this is the end of the road for Team USA. And there are 13 NHL games tonight. A lot of good matchups. Like we mentioned earlier in the show, Florida going into Vegas for a Stanley Cup final rematch. That's a game that we'll be watching tonight. Are there any other games that catch your attention tonight? Well, look, the Flyers need to stop the bleeding. They've lost five of their last six, albeit a couple of them in overtime where they were able to get points. But, you know, they're slowly starting to fade out of the playoff picture. And I think a lot of people have been waiting for this to happen to them. Um, so they're going to need to stop the bleeding. Another game, Tampa Bay and Minnesota. You know, the reason that I think that this game is important similarly is because these are two teams that they need to stop the bleeding a little bit. There's been inconsistent play. Minnesota's lost a couple of tough games um, after getting that new coach bump from John Hines. Uh, they're playing without about, about $50 million in their salary right now. I mean, they, they've got a bunch of call-ups. They're patching their roster together, but... You know, they're still hanging around, Johnny. And so I, I think that's an important game. What about you? What sticks out to you on the slate tonight? I mean, if you had to guess one game, which one would you guess? <laughs> I would say Chicago, New York Rangers. Tell us why you're excited about that, because there is good reason for not just Rangers fans, but NHL fans to be excited about that game. Yeah, believe it or not, it's not about Connor Bedard. Uh, yesterday, the Rangers recalled Brennan Othman, their first round 16th overall pick from 2021 uh, for his first ever call up in the NHL. He's going to make his NHL debut tonight. He's a prospect that Ranger fans have been excited about for years. He's won a World Juniors, uh, 50 goal scorer in the OHL. Kind of a guy that does it all. He plays a blue collar style. Uh, you know, he's been compared to Ryan Callahan, Braden Shen, um, you know, a couple of different personalities like that or, or excuse me, players like that. Um, so I think Ranger fans are going to be very excited to watch Brennan Othman skate in that number 78, the first time a player has worn 78 for the Rangers ever, which is a very interesting number. I'm curious to ask him about that tonight because I'll be... Sounds like a tra it's a training camp number, really. <clears throat> I don't know. No, he's worn it in junior. No, I know. I'm I'm, I'm just saying, generally speaking, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when, yeah. when a veteran player sees you know, 78, they're, they're, they're looking at him like, yep, you'll be back in the minors next week. Um, James Neal said that to me one time during an NHL game because I had number 36 on, but I chose 36 so he can Why? suck it. Um, well, I was just, not, there weren't a lot of options. I was presented with, you know, limited options. I wanted to have two numbers because my last name was so short. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to have like a short last name and only one number. 25 was taken. Chris Stewart offered it to me, but it was expensive. So I wasn't going to go, go do that. Um, 36 double high, you know what I mean? 18 high 36 double high. So, um, I, I wonder if a guy like Offman to kind of go back to him, mm -hmm. guys like that generally adjust quicker to the NHL because those types of players don't need to score to, to make an impact. Obviously it helps, but, but those guys who play a little bit more straight line games and a little bit more sandpaper like Ryan Callahan, they generally find their footing in the NHL a little bit quicker. So uh, this could be a huge, you know, quote unquote deadline type of acquisition if they can get Othman up to speed and they, they think that he can kind of do the job. Maybe he plays a couple of games now, he goes back, then the second time he comes up, maybe a little bit later in the season, it's for good. I've seen that path with players. Um, you know, I, I think the Rangers are in win now mode, so I'm sure they'll make some moves at the deadline. But uh, I'll be watching that game too, Johnny. 
Yeah, and I don't want to make this about the Rangers. This is actually a generic question, but Peter Laviolette has done it this year where he calls up a player from the AHL and puts them in a first-line, second-line position. He did it with Johnny Brodzinski when Brodzinski was leading the AHL in scoring. So Ranger fans right now are questioning where Othman will fit in this lineup, but it's not very common that guys get called up for the first time and see the top six. So what would you say as far as, uh, you know, put your coaching hat on, when you call up a player who plays first-line minutes, gets power play time in the AHL, and you put them, let's say, on a third, fourth line for their NHL debut, you're kind of setting them up for failure, right? Like, like what would you do in that scenario? Yeah, maybe not failure, putting them on the third line, um, because you got to remember, you're on an NHL third line. You know, let's say you're playing with Nick Benino, for example. Yep. You know, yeah, Nick yeah. Benino, um, Nick Benino was not always a third, fourth line player. You know, Nick Benino was a scorer. Nick Benino was an offensive player. He He's a hockey IQ genius, Nick Benino. So, um, I think there's opportunity. I think maybe you could see him start on the third line, but you know, get him on a power play. I- I'm a huge fan of getting a guy on a power play who's a power play player. Maybe it's the second unit. Uh, you're not touching not. that first unit, best unit in the league right now. So you're not touching the first unit, but I mean, look, I go back to my first NHL call up, and I'll give Joe Sacco a lot of credit there because my strength was playing on the offside of my power play. I, I could shoot a one timer. Um, And so they put me on a five on three power play, you know, my first or second night in the NHL because they wanted me to be successful. They were honestly sort of handing me some success doing that. Um, So I I like that. I'm glad Peter Laviolette is thinking that way. I bet you 10 years ago he wasn't thinking that way. Um, So it's good to see the the sort of uh, evolvement of him. Um, We'll see. I mean, weren't Othman and, and Bedard teammates at the World Juniors as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because I thought Othman played a big role uh, in that world junior team. I remember his name all over the broadcast. I remember when Patrick Kane was being talked about going to to New York, everybody wanted Othman in the return. You know, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And I think to wrap it up for today, the best game of the night, which we haven't mentioned yet, a central division matchup between the Colorado Avalanche and the Dallas Stars. Right now, the Stars have two games in hand of Colorado and they're three points back. So this is a huge game for Dallas. Nathan McKinnon and the Avalanche have been buzzing. The, the Dallas Stars, again, are an elite contender that probably aren't talked about, but top to bottom, I mean, they, they have one of the best goalies in the league in Jay Gottinger. They got a strong blue line and probably even stronger offense, but this game is going to be a game that most people should tune into tonight in the NHL. What do you think? And I love how you called me out the other day as I was chirping Georgiev a little bit um, huh. because I First went and looked wins. up the stats, and yeah. Georgiev doesn't even have a 900 save percentage. So mm-hmm. you can tell me about his wins, and then I'll show you his numbers, and I'll tell you right now the Avs are also outscoring goaltending problems. They just are. They're not getting consistent number one goaltending play. And I think that's going to be the difference for these two teams because Jake Ottinger is a true number one goaltender. So we'll watch that game for sure. I know you'll be up late um, watching probably Ottawa and Seattle. Seattle's <laughs> trending the right direction. Ottawa, we have no playoff idea team. what playoff we're team. ever getting out of Ottawa. You said they'd be a playoff team before the season started. So that's a minus one for you. Don't forget to like and subscribe the Daily Faceoff YouTube page. Don't forget to tune in Monday. We're going to have the Frank Vetrano beef hashed out, dropped into the show. We're going to really flush that whole situation out, Johnny. I'm kind of looking forward. Now I I have the whole weekend to prepare for that. Are you sure that we're going to flush it out? He might actually hate you more after talking to us. (laughs) Hey, listen, whatever happens, happens. We're going to see where the chips fall, bud. That's the the reality of uh, doing this live. Well, I just want to personally, and I'm sure Kobe wants to thank everyone for tuning into the first week of Morning Cup of Hockey. We're going to be doing this every Monday through Thursday at 9 a.m. And I really specifically, wholeheartedly want to thank our producer, Vic. Uh, he's been awesome. So a uh, big thank you to him. And uh, once again, that's going to wrap it up for today's show. We're going to talk to you guys on Monday with Frank Vetrano. Hope you all have a great weekend. Enjoy the games tonight. Enjoy the games over the weekend. Enjoy the World Junior. And we'll talk to you Monday morning. Thanks, everybody. What's up, hockey fans? If you enjoyed that video, then you need to be hitting the subscribe button right here at Daily Faceoff. Exclusive interviews and analysis from our hockey insider, Frank Saravalli, fantasy updates from Brock Sagan, and a daily live show at noon Eastern, Monday through Friday. You don't want to miss any of the fantastic content, so hit that subscribe button.